Welcome, everyone. Hello, hello. We are so excited to have you all with us today. Uh, my name is Taylor. If you haven't seen me here before, I will be your host for today's session. And joining me is Coach Mo. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Taylor. <clears throat> so good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I'm Coach Mo, as Taylor says. I've been with um, Click now for about sort of 18 months, I think. Seems quite a long time anyway, so, since Jeff started it. So I've been um, one of sort of the, the sort of foundation called coaches. I've uh, been on a journey with many hundreds of learners uh, over that period of time and delighted to be doing this first brand new challenge that we've uh, created, which is a three-part challenge around um, the soft skills you need as a BA to be able to do stakeholder interviews, document requirements and play them back, and also understand a bit more about the project lifecycle. So we've got three sessions lined up for you. This is the first one of those three. Um, normally during, when I'm not doing like click coaching sessions, I have a day job. Uh, I'm at, actually based in the UK, in London, and I work for a large uh, systems integrator called Cognizant. Uh, if you guys follow the F1, then you'll be familiar with some of our branding that we have on our Aston Martin cars. So we do a lot of um, <clears throat> technology implementations for a lot of the large clients across the world. Some of those implementations are quite big and hairy and complicated. Uh, and Salesforce is one of the technologies that we help our clients with. So we actually go in and help our larger clients to implement Salesforce. Uh, previously to Cognizant, I've been there for about two and a half years. I've been in CRM for about 20 years. I've done, of those 20 years, about 12 years in Salesforce and the other remaining years uh, prior to Salesforce, uh, there used to be a CRM solution which was big in the market before Salesforce came along called Siebel. So I worked with Siebel for quite a number of years and started my journey out as a, a product owner, um, a specialist in, in the firm that I used to work with to design CRM solutions and then from there moved into consulting. So I had sort of a quite a interesting career journey into Salesforce and CRM over those years. Um, delighted to be able to be here today to share, share some knowledge, but more importantly, for to help all of you on the call uh, to learn more about stakeholder interviews and give you a chance to be able to, to interview me as a stakeholder. Um, so yeah, looking forward to it, Taylor. Yeah, and we'll have cool. a lot of fun on these things as always. Yes, yeah, we're gonna have a great time today. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about our coach, or clicked principles here. We're going to learn from each other. Um, this is a safe space to try. Uh, so ask a new question, see what answers you get. And most of all, we're going to try to have fun. Um, it's a great way to kick off the week. So here's our agenda. Um, we're going over the overview here, some tips. We're going to have 45 minutes with our stakeholder. Um, we're going to take a break and get some feedback and then have a little bit of time at the end for question and answer. How do I interact in this session? The best way, that's up to you. But if you really want those questions answered, we need you to raise your hands, get in the queue, and come up on stage to help with this live interview. Um, as always, you're welcome to participate in the chat, and you can ask questions there and use the Q&A box. But um, to see really the benefits of the session with the interview with the stakeholder, get in that line and get your hand up so you can ask your questions here live. Um, and that's how we're all going to learn the best in this session. So let me introduce the scenario and the task. The scenario, you are a Salesforce business analyst working with Stanford D School, an online comprehensive university known for its innovation and excellent academics. Up until this point, Stanford used Forms and Google Sheets to manage course enrollment. They recently hired your team to adjust their systems to begin using Salesforce to manage course enrollment as there has been an increase in demand for expanding their course offerings. Analytics and reporting were not an emphasis in the earlier phases of the project. Stanford has now realized how powerful a robust dashboard can be for decision-making between teams. In this experience, you'll sit the role of a business analyst to brainstorm discovery session questions and then ask them to the stakeholder. Here we go, here's our task. We are going to be interviewing Peter Wu, the VP of Technology at Stanford D School. Once you have prepared your questions, um, consider how you're going to introduce yourself up here on stage. And then in our live experience here, come on up 
And uh, here's some questions that you should have thought about, <laughs> hopefully before today, but um, how are you gonna introduce yourself to the stakeholder? What are you gonna do to stay engaged while other people are asking questions? Here's a great one. If someone asks your question, what's your backup question? What are you gonna do next? Um, and then using active listening skills to understand the stakeholder's problem. All right, Mo, do you have any coach tips before we get started? <clears throat> yeah, very, very quickly. Um, I mean, in terms of tips, this is a, a, a three part program. So this one's quite important, the stakeholder interview in that you need to listen. So you, even if you're not participating in asking the questions, those of you that are sort of in on the call, you've got to really listen intensively and make some really good notes because those will form the the input into your next session, which is where you will come back and present back to Peter the requirements of how you understand what he wants. Uh, <clears throat> so this session is quite important from a listening perspective. I think, like you say, Taylor, you know, there'll be there are definitely going to be occasions if we go through this questioning where your questions have been covered. So you need to have a backup. But it's not always about a backup because you might have, through your listening, picked up some information that Peter's given you earlier, which you think actually no one's bothered asking him about that. So you might want to deep dive into some of the information that, that Peter has been giving you as we go through. <clears throat> the stakeholder, pretty much, if you think about Peter as a stakeholder, you don't know what he's going to tell you, right? So you're going to be pretty much working blind up to a point. All you have is the questions and the, the answers. Uh, but doesn't mean that you can change. It, it means you can actually you can change your tact and um, you know introduce a new question um, that you've thought about during the course. So you don't have to stick to the script necessarily, right? So uh, listen and adapt and be flexible about your questioning skills. Uh, keep them quite open the questions and uh, try to ask me questions that will engage me and generate some really rich responses. If you ask me a close question, chances are you'll probably get a close response. Um, so you, you need to sort of, yeah, be conscious of that. But yeah, as I say, have fun. It's a great, it's going to be a great 40 minutes or so that we're going to spend interacting. Um, if you haven't ever been on the stage online and, and, you know, been in the position of presenting yourself and asking questions to take, take the, 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 the leap today and come on stage. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, Let's make a start, I think. Yeah. Let's get into it. Okay, so we're going to transform here to Peter Wu joining us on stage. And that's, let's get started. Our timer is going to start now. Um, so we are going to go ahead and, and kick off. And let's see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Rohan says Mo has transformed. That's right. Okay, a new raised hand. Let's see who we've got. Um, let's get you up on stage. Guillermo, are you there? Guillermo. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Good. Very pleased to be here. <laughs> Thanks for ha having us. It's, I think it's a great opportunity for us to learn uh, so i really appreciate okay um i did my homework i have uh, i chose six questions for peter uh, mohammed <laughs> so uh, i i would like to know if uh, you want me to read them all at once or should we interact with each question? Uh, so, Guillermo, I'm going to cut in here and just say we're going to go with two questions. So, pick your top two, um, and then you can you can ask the first one and let him answer, and then we'll do the second one and let him answer as well. Okay. 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 Um, sure. Uh, the first question would be um, maybe it's not the most important, but I would like to uh, stick. To the order um, because I think uh, as, as we are working on this project um, there are steps that we need to take so my first question is uh, have you already evaluated the scope of education cloud versus Salesforce for education or would you say that this should be part of the consultancy work 
Uh, <clears throat> so um, we we can you hear me? Okay, you might, yeah? You can hear me fine, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, your question is whether we've evaluated Education Cloud and whether that's in scope. So just to just to um, help your understanding, I'll tell you where we are with our journey. So we've already got Salesforce. We're using that for our students to be able to enroll on courses. So we have Experience Cloud sitting at the front, which our students go to, uh, to be able to look at all our courses and browse our courses. They can then go through an entire enrollment process through Experience Cloud to be able to book a course, pay for a course. Um, so that is all currently there, um, working in the background. I think where we are now with our journey is the next phase, which is about, we've now got you know, all of that working, we've got the data coming through. What I don't see at the moment as um, as, as the head of, of, of uh, technology um, is the sort of insights. And what I really want uh, you guys to do is to come in and sort of build me really some dashboards, some reports that can really bring that data to me in a, in a very valuable way. So I can actually start to use that data to make some very informed, business decisions about what we do next. Does that help? Yes, uh, very much. Thank you. Um, my bad. I thought uh, that you were using Google spreadsheets or we, at least we were. We were. Nothing. Yeah, we were okay. previously. We, we were using Google spreadsheets and all sorts of manual stuff. But, um, you know, we've gone through We've gone through a recent uh, implementation of Salesforce, so we are actually on the platform today. Uh, I think it's now the sort of next stage of the journey, really, in terms of where we take it. Okay. Okay, clear. Thank you. Uh, so my next question would be, uh, how many are areas would you say uh, are interested in having these uh, dashboards? And how many uh, workers uh, would you say that there are in in each area okay <clears throat> so that's a good question so our business is sort of split up into different functions uh so we if essentially we have an operations team so when the enrollment data comes in from students the operation team deals with the learner support and getting everything uh, organized in terms of making sure you know the learner is registered on the system and everything is going out at the right time in the right place and you know they're being lined up on the right course etc so we have an operations team that consists of probably around 20 people at the moment we then also have a marketing team so their job is really and this is where we could do with some help around uh, understanding what the trends are so they can actually start to market to students where course enrollment is low uh, we need to encourage people to sign up well, and, and also to look at how we target existing students that have been on previous courses with new courses. Um, so getting them to sign up for, for more learning. So marketing, the marketing team are quite crucial to actually growing uh, our business uh, in that sector. So marketing team currently consists of about five people, right? Um, some are part time. So, you know, give or take probably if you look at it on a full time basis, probably about three people um, full time equivalents. Then we have, we've got a sort of learning content department that builds the learning content on the curriculum. And their job is to keep all the curriculum um, up to date, but also look at new courses that we are looking to develop from the trends that we see in the market and from the trends that we see in our own data. Uh, you know, which topic areas are, are, are most interesting, where people are signing up and what is the next thing that we can offer them. So their, their job is really to build out content um, ready for, for, for the marketing team to market. We've got roughly about um, five people on that team that build the content out um, full time and maintain the content. And then the other department is the finance department. <clears throat> so although they're not directly involved in any of these other areas, they are very involved with making sure that they have a view of how much money is coming in, forecasted to come in from students over the coming months. Uh, as, as we progress the academic year. So for them, it's more about forecasting. It's more about looking at, you know, how many people do we have in the pipeline? Which of those people are going to convert to students um, that are going to come through and, and what's our projected income um, coming through over the next quarter or a few quarters? So really, those are the key departments. 
couple couple of people on awesome. finance that manage that for us. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. I think I spent my two questions already. Thank you. Thank you, Guillermo. All right, next up we have Monica. Monica, come up on stage. Um, and Sam, you can you can guess your top two questions up here today. Okay. Yeah, hi, Peter. This is Monica, hi, Monica. here. Uh, Hi, I'm a Salesforce business analyst with the team who has worked with you and your team uh, for the prior implementation. And uh, we are really looking forward to this new piece of functionality that we are planning to add. Uh, so to summarize what I heard before in this you know, call is like we are mainly focusing on the analytics and the reporting side of the uh, functionality now because we want to help business with the decision making. Uh, so keeping that in mind, like apart from uh, the reports in the dashboard, is there any other area that we want to include in our scope? Um, not for now, because I think, <clears throat> excuse me, this phase is pretty much more about reporting and analytics at the moment. There might be, we, we have a backlog of some enhancements we want to do to the uh, current functionality, but that will just be taken care of as usual, sort of uh, okay. business as usual. So I think we want to treat this as a separate sort of piece of work and project all okay. around reporting and analytics. Okay. Now, uh, great to know that. Now, uh, understanding that, what are the main key process indicators that we are looking for? <clears throat> the few that I heard in the previous answer was like uh, the course enrollments, like how many students have enrolled for the course and where the enrollment is low. So that one piece I have noted down, but what are the other key performance indicators we are looking for? Yeah, <clears throat> so there's a number of things that we can actually, we want to try and get out of the data that we have today in Salesforce. Uh, so I can run through a few of those. One is that I want to understand <clears throat> how quickly the classes are filling up. So which of our courses are quicker to fill and are hence more popular, right? Um, also linked to that, I also want to know where we are oversubscribed on courses, so where we've got a course which sells out and we have people on the wait list, you know, so that indicates to us that we've either got to run more courses uh, to accommodate those those people that are, can't sort of sign on because we, we're limited in terms of our capacity. Mm -hmm. So those are sort of linked. It's understanding, you know, how quickly, how quickly courses are filled up and how many disappointed I guess customers we have because they can't get onto a course because we don't have enough capacity um, <clears throat> the other the other key one for me is also we um, we collect a customer satisfaction score at the end of the learning and some feedback at the end of the learning again I think it would be useful to have an understanding of the reporting by course by tutor you know and across you know topic areas about what that what that score looks like right so it's again using that data but looking at it at different levels uh, depending on who, who it is we're measuring whether it's the tutor's quality of delivery and teaching uh, or, or the overall course content or whatever so we do ask for those scores from our learners mm -hmm. um, but at the moment we're just not doing too much with it other than putting it into a spreadsheet now and then and, and then sort of having a, a quick review of it but to have that on a dashboard real time will be really helpful Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I think the other the other thing is uh, we we want to also measure really the um, the dropouts as well because what what happens when when you get through a course sometimes people students think it's not the right thing for me or they want to switch courses or drop out I'd also mm -hmm. like to understand you know what the trends are there because. If we have a high dropout rate in a course, we need to really understand why that is and, and try and investigate the reasons behind that versus a course where we, you know, 100% start on day one and then, you know, 100% are still there at the end of the course. Mm -hmm. So, again, having that sort of measure would be really useful for me. So I think those are some of the key ones for now. Um, mm -hmm. I think as, as you are consultants and you work with other education customers, I'd be really interested to hear about what other customers are doing as well so if you've got any ideas about other metrics that we should be considering I'd be interested in looking at those as well okay okay great great so yeah sure uh, we will work with the team and we will share our inputs with you too so thank you so much for sharing the insight with us thank you thanks Monica thank you, Peter. Thanks. Hey, you're on mute, I think. 
Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, hey, up next we've got Orlando here on stage. Uh, Orlando, you can ask your top two questions as well. Okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm very grateful to be here. Well, first of all, my, my name is Orlando. I am the business analyst from, from our team. We are regarding here to, to ask you some important questions that we need to address in order to get the most insights from, from the requirements for the, for the, for the project. So my, our first question is, I don't know if I believe you say something about it, but, but I believe it's important to, to make a highlight of this. What are the specific data points that are most crucial in your decision making process related to the course enrollment? Uh, like uh, what is the KPP, KPPI, the business slides on this? You say something about it, you need to do, do, drop out um, and the change of the course, maybe also the, the I don't know, the, the, the financial, financial aspect or I don't know, something like that. What are your thoughts about it or what is your requirement? Yeah, I think I sort of, um, <clears throat> the key ones I, 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 I sort of, previously answered around what the question was from Monica in terms of the type of things that I want to see on a dashboard. I think one which I probably didn't cover is finance. So, you know, again, I, I, I want to see, you know, by, by week, by month, by quarter, what the revenue is coming through from <clears throat> course enrollments. Um, so again, you know, seeing that trend, whether that's an upward trend or there's, there's a dip for whatever reason through the year, we want to sort of see those trends and try and plan for those with the marketing team. So again, yeah, you know, the financial aspect of a reporting is, is quite important for me and for the finance team as well to consider, okay, if this is the trend in 2023, we need to make sure we sort of even out the, the revenue in 2024. So what are we going to do to try and uh, tackle where we've got low, um, low income coming through in certain parts of the year? Uh, and how does marketing, our marketing team drive more demand. So that's really um, that's really where I am in terms of what I want. Okay, thank you so thank you so much. The another point that we have here that we'd like to discuss to you is which team or individuals they'll need access to these analytics and what level of Excel should they should have. Yeah, so I sort of mentioned the four teams earlier, the, the, the four key teams that would need access to the dashboards and the reports. So that's marketing, finance, operations, and the course design team. So those are the four teams. Um, again, I, I, haven't, I haven't got the level of detail you're asking me for at the moment in terms of what they need to see and how, you know, who needs to see it, but that's something that we can define as the project goes through. Um, but again, you know, if you have any any recommendations on how you've set this up um, previously for other clients, then I'd like to see that. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, happy happy to help, and thank you for your answers. Thanks, Alanda. All right, thanks, Orlando. We've got Cassandra up next. Cassandra, come on up. Let's see. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. Good afternoon, Hi. Uh, Mr. Wu. Um, I am your business analyst for your project currently. And I would like to know what are, what is your top pain point in your flow currently? And actually, what is your flow currently for for presenting uh, data to your executives? Uh, so at the moment, we, we sort of tend to export that data um, through some basic reporting <clears throat> using Salesforce. So it's normally, normally done in Excel and manipulated to what we want. <clears throat> so we can give you copies of, of some of the, the basic reports that we, we produce. But I say I've talked you through to the three or four key reports. So this is all about understanding, you know, which courses are oversubscribed, uh, how long does it take to fill up a course, how many people have we got on a wait list that couldn't get onto a course, um, 
you know, the dropout rates from the course, CSAT scoring, those are sort of key key metrics at the moment that we're manually deriving from the data, which I would love to see on a, just a dashboard on a daily basis for, for, our, for our users. Um, now then marketing, for example, can actually use those insights to be able to then uh, figure out, you know, what sort of marketing plans do we need to think about? Finance have got a view of what's coming in, right, in terms of money. Um, operations can see, you know, what the, the potential demand is coming through from courses and how quickly courses are being filled up. So there's a, you know, depending on the function, there'll be different ways that the data will be used by individuals. But I think at a base level, um, I'm quite happy for those four or five reports to be shared with all of the functions and they can then deep dive into those reports and use them as they wish. Okay. Um, based on that answer, I am curious. You did mention that you would like to see those numbers on a daily basis. Are any of the your key stakeholders wanting to see uh, real-time uh, data? Ideally, everybody would want to see real-time data. So that's <clears throat> that's my starting position. If if you and Salesforce keeps selling, telling me and selling me real-time data, so yeah, uh, that's where I would want to be. Um, is is that something that's possible? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. I, so let's there there is definitely a distinction between uh, a daily report versus real-time. So I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. of your expectations i want to meet your expectations yeah so all the data that we hold for our student enrollments <clears throat> in salesforce there's no other external system holding that data so i would assume um, technically you can do that real time okay thank you sir okay my last question would be um what are your expectations on scalability let's say as a projecting projection of three years from now in terms of so <clears throat> when you say scalability eh, what what exactly you're referring to your, uh, as far as the capacity to be able to accommodate your students because there seems to be a flux that you mentioned uh, with enrollment Yeah, so our business plan is to double every year <clears throat> over the okay. next three years. Um, a lot of our courses are now delivered online, which which makes it easier to scale. Um, <clears throat> so we can we can run um, we can run a lot more courses because again we don't have to have tutors in classrooms. They can be based anywhere really in the world and run a course. So I think with the technology that we've got now from Salesforce. Um, and the ability to be able to recruit trainers from anywhere to be able to run courses uh, the doubling our revenue figures every year for the next three years is pretty realistic so yeah that's where we're at great so, thank you mr Wu. thank you cassandra thanks cassandra all right up next we have allison and then rohan great hi, hi allison. Mr. Wu. I'm Allison Lacalle. Oh, my camera's off. Hmm. Okay. It says it's not accessible. Okay. Um, I'm a business analyst on the team, and I'm also someone with a background in education and survey research. So about your customer satisfaction score, I had a few questions. I'm assuming you asked them this on the phone on the experience cloud after they complete a course. Is that Correct, all yeah. you ask? Do you, do you um, ask them other questions such as um, what other courses might you be interested in taking? How much would you be willing to spend? Would a 10 or 15% discount entice you to sign up for another course within 30 days of finishing this course? Or is it simply just a customer satisfaction score? <clears throat> At the moment, it's just a, a customer satisfaction score. <clears throat> but what we would like to do on the back of that is once, for example, somebody does complete a customer satisfaction score, is be able to go out with, to them with an email with some recommendations based on their historical purchases 
of course courses with us um, and offering them a discount so again it sort of ties very much the data that we have ties in with the sort of marketing department uh, which i don't think we're at at this moment in time with our journey um but yeah i mean we we may we may choose to ask those questions in future but at the moment they're very sort of they're very measured questions which give us an overall sort of um you know score um so that's where we are at today but i say that that we can sort of build in a bit more uh clever use of that data going forward uh, but at the moment we just don't have we, we just don't even have visibility unless we do unless we sort of manipulate the data manually <clears throat> so to give you an example, if somebody scored us very poorly on a CSAT score, the way we market to them will be very different to somebody that's scored as 10 out of 10. Um, so it's that sort of that granular level of detail that we need to get to um, with the data that we have. But 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 again, we need to understand the, the bigger picture as well. Okay. Is is there somebody on the marketing team who is um, particularly proficient in that kind of uh, analysis and information gathering because... Yeah, so... <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's their job. So so their job is to really look at the data, segment the data, and then get the marketing campaigns in the way based on, you know, you know very, various campaigns. Um, so whether that's a campaign to try and get Dorpen students back onto, onto a course versus... <clears throat> those students that are already engaged to keep them to keep them engaged right so um, <clears throat> again something that we're looking to consider in the future not today could be some sort of loyalty scheme as well so the more you the more you learn the more you earn in terms of loyalty points and gives you greater discounts or whatever so it's something we are thinking about as a management team at the moment uh, but again to make that those decisions and the cost of those decisions we need to rely on some data that we build up over time and have the insights of that data. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Allison. And up next we have Rohan. Come on up. You're on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, when I plug in my webcam and it, it changes the audio input. Hi, Peter. Uh, my name is Rohan Agrawal, a business analyst along with the team. After getting some questions and answers from them, I had a couple of follow-ups. I noticed that you mentioned that you want to track the student dropouts. What defines as like dropping out in the middle of the semester or do they fail the course? <clears throat> is that your definition for that? So so a dropout is somebody that actually doesn't complete the course. So there are going to be students that, that may sit an exam at the end of certain courses and they fail. That that's really fine. And we we have a scheme in place to offer them free retakes, etc. But these are learners that for whatever reason within the first few weeks they decide actually this is not for me. I'm going to quit. Um, what what we want to try and understand is where is that happening right within which courses how often um and we can then start to delve in a bit more deeper than bringing the feedback scores that we also get because again if people drop out we send them a questionnaire to understand why so we can then again use use a combination of the dropout data the feedback to try and mend those courses and make them better um and so yeah it's any any individual of their own choice that has decided to leave the course at any point in time okay and is there a last like a deadline in which students can drop out most students drop out within the first three or four weeks generally once they've gone past that they generally stick to the course and see it through so it's 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 what you would expect in education typical universities etc where year one of your degree you you're more likely to drop out versus year two three four whatever so okay and i remember one of my colleagues mentioning that you guys are currently using experience cloud uh, have you thought about using the Salesforce Education Cloud product? Like the we haven't done that, that no, or no, is no, that a follow-up thing that you would be interested in doing? Assuming that yeah, we'll be happy to have a, a look at job that. here. Yeah, we'd okay. be happy to have a look at that. Um, Salesforce has mentioned Education Cloud and some of the features around it. Um, 
but yeah, we'd, we'd be happy to move to that. I think at this moment in time, because we've only just got started, um, it's a decision we would probably do further down the line. Uh, what I want to do is to see some some return on the data that we've already got in the system today. Want to make sure that what you currently have can be properly utilized. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Rohan. All right, up next we have Marina. Hello. Yeah, hi. Um, I have also some, um, I'm Marina and I'm learning now to be the uh, consultant and the business analyst. My question are, the first one, are you concerning the data? Because we have spoken about the current students. Are you expecting to analyze also your post-graduated students and the grants and their research works they are doing? It's it's useful, yeah. But I think it's something that we would look at developing later. <clears throat> so I think if you were to prioritize the type of reports that we want to start with, it's the ones that I've described. I think there's certainly value in analyzing students that have, you know, taken the course with us previously <clears throat> that are sort of dormant. So they've not done anything for the last couple of years with us. Um, so, yeah, we would definitely want to look at those and see how we can get them re-engaged. Um, but I, I guess, you know, what we what we want to really do is look at the current data, the active students that we have, which currently we, we sort of, yeah, I guess doing it with spreadsheets and stuff. So. The answer is yes, Marina, but I think it's not a priority for me at the moment. Okay. Uh, uh, the second question deals with the future students. Um, I'm expecting you are doing some kind of marketing at school that to 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 to, um, to win this the future student to your university. So are you um, are you doing such kind of marketing? And would you like to to see the KPIs in your reporting and uh, the analysis? Yeah, we do. <clears throat> so we market through partners as well. Um, so yeah, it'd be useful to understand how our partners are performing in terms of enrollment versus our direct marketing as well. I think if you look at the split today, um, probably about 30% is coming in from partners uh, and then 70% is coming from direct marketing that we do with um, with students. We also um, we do quite a lot of publicity, paid publicity around our courses on social marketing, social networks as well. So, um, and paid for advertising. So 70% of it is direct, 30% through other learning partners. Uh, so, um, based on this question, I have asked and your answer, uh, you would like also see these evaluations in your future analysis? Yeah. What yeah. 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 Okay, and yeah. um, thank you. And uh, one more question is concerning the prediction. Would you like to have a prediction in your um, analysis and reportings to see what kind of courses you need in um, in two or three or probably in a half a year? And what uh, is the future area of education will be more popular and the other area of education will be less popular? Uh, would you use it? Would you involve such predictions too? <clears throat> yeah, I think what what we would also want to see is you know our, our data against the market data. So there is market external market data available around things you know how how popular courses are and the uplift and the trend on those courses. So I think what would be good to to see is how Stanford um, are doing in relation to the overall market in those topic areas are we performing well underperforming or are we you know doing doing overperforming the market so i think bringing some of that external data <clears throat> excuse me through into our analysis would be helpful to look at the future trends and yeah if if recommendations and things can be done in the future uh through external ai models etc that would be really interesting for us and also the number of uh, and predict predict also the number of uh, students it will be I think it will be also very useful. Yeah, definitely for our finance department etc. Looking at those trends and forward planning revenue um, resources etc. Yeah, definitely. So we can do that sort of predictive piece of analysis on top of the data that will be really helpful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Thanks, Marina. 
All right, thank you, Marina. Um, so while we wait to see if anyone else, I think Guillermo might wanna come back up and ask, yeah, he's got his question coming on up again. Hi, Guillermo. I'm back, thank you. You're back. <laughs> I, 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 with regards to the partners you have just mentioned uh, about the marketing campaigns, uh, do you already have the integrations uh, set up with the partners? Uh, how is the uh, data um, yeah. that the partners uh, generate uh, being uploaded to the Salesforce platform? Yeah, so, so the partners also use Experience Cloud. Uh, so partners have their own login as a partner to be able to enroll students onto our courses. So we don't have any separate system for partners. It's all integrated in Salesforce. They are just treated as an account um, in our in our system. Um, so yeah, that's how we collect the data. So partners are part of the parcel of Salesforce experience. Okay, great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and we'll get Monica up here. She had a follow-up question, I think, as well. Yeah, hi, Peter. This is Monica here again. Um, as we're talking a lot about data here, my team also has one question regarding the data privacy and the visualization constraints, if we have any. Because we are talking about a lot of reports and the dashboard that we are going to build. So uh, are we currently aware of any constraint, like this particular data shouldn't be you know, viewed by this particular team? Or it's just like we want to make a team-specific report? <laughs> So those are the kind of details uh, we want to understand. Yeah, <clears throat> so I think, um, you know, there'll be specific reports that one team sees as a priority as, uh, over another team. I think in general, I think the reports that I've described can be available for all of those functions. So in terms of keeping it simple at this stage, I'm happy for that data to be shared across all of the four functions that I talked about. I don't think there's a there's an issue from my perspective, from a technology perspective, any any reason why we wouldn't be able to share that data across those four functions. Um, so at the moment, assume that it's a fairly simple security model, data model, sorry, sharing model, should I say, okay. um, that, yeah, anybody can see anything for now. Okay, and are we looking forward to like emailing those reports or just the report and dashboard, which, you know, the different teams will log in and see in the system, or we are even yeah. looking at getting it emailed at particular interval or something like that? Uh, I think just having the dashboards uh, for them to log in would, would be would be good. Um, I think we, if there's a simple way of just switching on an email report, <clears throat> and a frequency, then, you know, again, I'd be interested in, in getting that up and running. But, uh, yeah, if it's simple to do, I, I, I'll get that. I think we should get that on day one then, and we can agree on who gets what by email. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. Well, thank you so much. Peter. All right. Thanks, Monica. And we're going to bring Guillermo back up. I guess in between, he's had time to process and come on up and ask your next question. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to know uh, how much time would you say the key users of each area would spend with us uh, developing the dashboards and, and eventual reports and real-time data with us weekly in a weekly basis or, or daily basis, maybe? Yeah, I mean... It'd be good to it'd be good to sort of do a, a, a proper discovery workshop with each of these functions to look at the data that they need uh, and which data is sort of standard across all of them. I think in terms of time, it's hard to say. I mean, they they also have a day job to do. So I would say that most people will be able to free up, you know, two or three hours a week initially to spend time defining the reports, checking, validating those reports as well. Um, you know, down to sort of layout level. So yeah, I mean, take that as a, a rough rule of thumb to oh. two to three hours a week per function. Okay, uh, good. Um, the, the other question I, I would ask is, um, do you think it would be um, possible that we have access to 
uh, the playgrounds with uh, maybe mocked uh, data or um, encrypted data, but uh, to work actually with, with uh, the courses and all the objects that you already have <coughs> on the Salesforce platform? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can take a data dump uh, for you at, uh, of, of the production system and put that into test or development uh, so you can play around with real data. So yeah, no problem with that. You can take a copy of the data. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks, Guillermo. Okay, so in the um, in the chat, we had a little bit of an interesting discussion. Jamie had mentioned that um, Peter has asked twice now about seeing another school metrics. Um, would it be possible to give a quick demo or share a screenshot of a homepage of schools that we have worked with so you could see what we could do visually? Would that be something that would appeal to you, Peter? Do you think that would be useful in this situation? I think it would be, yeah. I'd, I'd be interested to, to sort of see that in the next session that we have when you can define sort of, you know, what the, the discussion we've had today and then maybe come also prepared with your thoughts and, and ideas as well on how you as consultants can add a bit more value to what we're doing because you have a broader view of what's going on in the education market uh, with your clients. So again, yeah, I'm be delighted to see what else you guys can come up with. And I think let's save that for another day. All right, cool. That sounds great. All right, well, we are, I think, a little bit here out of time with our stakeholder. So we're going to take a minute, give Mo a breather <laughs> with all the questions. Um, thank you all. That was an amazing job, an amazing session. Um, everyone who came up on stage, such good questions. Um, you know, active listening, making sure that you're listening to the previous questions. So you're not repeatedly asking the stakeholder the same thing over and over and over. So it's really nice when you can get in there, get some diverse questions. Even we saw some building on questions. I think Rohan had asked questions that built on previous questions. So you can dive a little bit deeper and get a little bit more knowledge there. Um, so it was really useful as well. Um, I thought that was really great to hear. Um, and let's see. So Mo, um, as Mo, <laughs> can you talk a little bit to why we spend so much time on discovery and, and why this is so important as opposed to just jumping into a project? Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, just to say the questions that the, the uh, learners came up with on stage were great questions. You know, it's it's really shows the amount of thought that's gone into it. Um, and I know that because it's, it's quite difficult for me to sort of think of the answers on, on, on the uh, on the go because none of this is prepared right this is all pretty it's pretty much improvised as we go along uh, I have a brief the same brief as you and I'm going to make things up as to what would happen in a real scenario so um, it, it's it's uh, the learners have been very good in that they put me in a tough situation to talk about this uh, particular scenario and you will get to a point where you're already working on a project which is what this is and you're now looking at phase two which is okay, you've set me up on Salesforce and I now want to get more value out of it. So let's have a look at the data and the analytics. Now, um, you know, you've asked some really excellent questions around what sort of data do I want to see? Uh, which are the functions that want to see that data? Is there anything that I need to consider around privacy of data? All really, really good questions that I would expect a, a good BA to ask. So I think there's quite a bit of information I've given, given to you. I think the other thing, which you picked up on is um, sometimes um, your stakeholder may not know everything, right? So they're looking to you as a consultant to bring some innovation and ideas. So that's why I sort of threw it back to you saying, you know, these are the four or five things I think I need, but am I missing something here? Because is there any other organizations that are looking at the data in a different way? So I think you taking that away and coming back with some ideas as part of your validation process would really, I think really add to your credibility as a BA with uh, with Peter and the team um, and just improve that overall relationship that you have with the client. So I think, yeah, for me, the, the, the sessions have been great in terms of the quality of questioning. Um, I think, again, you know, we've always said on these sessions, you're not going to get every single piece of uh, insight and answer to what you want, but I think you have 
you have a bit of creativity, so go away. If there are missing pieces, fill them in, make some assumptions, and then come back and validate those requirements. So if, even if you fill those missing pieces in with your assumptions, you can always validate them with me when we come back in a few days to, to go through your, your requirements documentation. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's a whole, whole load, load of information there that I've unloaded. Um, it's now how you, how you're going to structure that and play that back to me in a logical order next time, which will be interesting to see. But yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my view is it's been, it's been a great session, some good quality questioning. I think like you say, people have picked up on a lot of the things that I sent through active listening and sort of gone back and revisited that topic area again. So yeah, really well done. Cool. Uh, Monica is asking, what are different ways that we can validate requirements with a stakeholder? Um, it depends, and there's no right or wrong answer to that one. Um, <clears throat> so different different BAs have different ways of validating. I mean, you 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 got to look at documenting these requirements. So you will have your own notes today that you've taken. Um, we've recorded this interview as well, so you can play it back again if you want. And I think you then need to sit down and work out, okay, how do I document this? So if I was going to play this back to Peter in a week's time, how do I go back to Peter and say, hey, you know, we had that interview back on Monday. These, these, are, these are what I think are the handful of requirements that I got from the interview, uh, from what I heard. Um, they can be documented into, you know, paragraphs. They can be documented into epics or user stories. You know, you might want to choose your own way of doing this. Um, so yeah, I'm going to leave it pretty much up to the audience because I want to see a different variety of things that we we we, we get to view next time. Um, I don't want to give you just one thing and say you need to do it in this format. So let's let's have a look at what you guys can come back with. Um, pictures, diagrams, text. I want to see a mixture of stuff. So unfortunately, I can't give you an answer, but I can give you some guidance as to how you might want to do it. Yeah, cool. So, so the typical clicked answer, right? It depends. We'll see. Uh, depends. We'll see what comes up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you look around, everyone has a different way of documenting requirements. I mean, some organisations like Cognizant, who I work with, will have a um, a format, formal methodology way of doing it. So, in larger organisations, more structure. As a BA, you have to follow a format or a framework that you need to do to document these requirements. But what we're going to do here on click is just leave it pretty much open to you to to come up with your own ways of playing it back um because the more you, the more we see the better and then you can you feel comfortable you know you might feel oh, that, that idea that looks quite good i'll try that next time so let's do that let's just leave it pretty much open-ended yeah all right sounds good um and then i think i'm gonna wrap this up i'm gonna ask a, a bigger question like an overall question here but um let's say what makes a question effective um, and how do you structure your interview questions to get the most out of that when you're talking to a stakeholder with a limited amount of time? So <clears throat> the, the biggest thing I find when people are asking questions is they try and complicate the question itself and therefore it takes a long time for the stakeholder to try and figure out what is it I'm being asked here or they give you the wrong answer or don't half answer it. So I think the, the big thing around questioning skills is keep your questions very short and concise. And if it, you know, always look at your question, and analyze it. Can I break this down into two questions maybe or three questions? Um, because giving um, you, you know multiple questions at a time is very, very confusing for a stakeholder. Uh, so again, think about it. There has been probably some examples today if you play this back where people have asked two or three questions in a single question, avoid that at all costs. Keep it simple, keep one question at a time, and then follow on um, to keep it a fairly logical conversation. Um, so you're keeping the stakeholder pretty much engaged, but also helping them not to think about 16 things at the same time. You know, you're sort of breaking it down for them in their mind. So it's easier for them to sort of come out with what you, the information you need. Um, so yeah, so help help your stakeholder by asking simple, concise, and well structured questions, which are logical. Yeah, perfect. I was just going to say, um, similar. Rohan says here, similar to user stories, break it down if you can break it down. Um, and you know, our business process maps too. You want to keep it simple. Um, that's a, a really good phrase overall for for everything we're doing here today. Yep. 
Um, thank you so much for all of that feedback. Uh, hey guys, I pinned at the top of the chat a, a discussion for a feedback form there. If you have a second and you haven't filled it out yet, um, we would love your feedback on this session and what you thought and how it went. Um, we read each and every one of those forms. We'd really appreciate that. And then looking ahead here um, in this challenge, today was our interactive session with our stakeholder. Um, the next session is going to be our feedback session. So we're going to be validating our stakeholder requirements. So we'll be doing that on Wednesday. Um, so we'll be looking forward to seeing you all there at the next session. Um, and then, yeah, this is going to be a new experience here. So um, if Mo, if you could talk a little bit about validating requirements and some quick tips for the next session before we <clears throat> wrap up here. Yeah, so um, like I said, I think go back through your notes. Um, I think a good thing would be for you to sort of have a quick replay of the video as well, because it's quite hard to capture everything at this, you know, when, when, when he's trying to think of questions. So particularly those people that were on stage asking the question, your section I would replay back so you really know what, what, what was said and you can, you've got a chance to sort of write your notes down because he's always under pressure when he's on stage here. So one, um, Recordings there, play it back. Second, take some time to actually pick out all the main themes and the requirements that Peter has articulated today. So that could only be five or six things, right? So pick the big things that Peter is concerned about and what he wants. And then look at how you want to document that. So whether that's going to be in a PowerPoint, whether that's going to be in a mind map, choose whatever method you want to be able to come back to Peter and say, hey, we had a conversation a week ago. This is what I think you need, right? So let's go through it. So you need to play it back to me, um, but I need to see it visually as well. So I need to understand how you've come about um, coming up with those those stakeholder requirements. So this stage, you know, they don't need to be 100 requirements. They need to be fairly broad, um, picking up on, on the things that Peter has told you. Uh, so you can go back and say, yeah, we're on the same page, Peter. Yeah, I can now go back and do some more detailed work around discovery, et cetera, in those areas. So again, you know, when you're on a, on a project and a natural journey would be that you have these broad requirements at the very top that Peter has come up with. Peter says, I've got four departments here. Go away, talk to those guys. Yeah, but this is the direction I want you to go in. So you will then spend two or three hours with those end users saying, okay, well, how do you want to see your report? How do you use your reports? What data do you have access to? Blah, blah, blah. So all that detail comes further down the line. So your job for the next session is really to distill the conversation we've had around 40 minutes or so into some very clear bullet point requirements, visual requirements, however you want to structure it. So we have a set of building blocks to work with. So uh, Rohan's question is, are we building solutions and wireframing for this next session? No, you're not solutioning. You're still in validation stage. So you are not here to do any, any solutions or give me any screenshots, etc. You are Maybe the next session is about you understanding my requirements. So have you understood them? Can you play them back? Can you pick out the key messages that Peter has told you today? And what are those key messages that you're trying to trying to help him with? What are you going to sort of overall build for him? So that's that's the challenge. Um, so I don't want to see any solutions for the next session. No. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. All right. Well, thank you so much to Mo and Peter for showing up here for us today. We had a great session, um, a great interview, and I am loving all of the feedback we've had in the chat. Um, I hope that you do take Mo's advice and go back and rewatch this so you can get as much information out of it as you can. So we can come back here on Wednesday and see how far we get. Uh, in the meantime, if you have any other questions, feel free to take it over to the Slack channel. Um, we can chat over there and, and figure it out together. So thank you so much, everyone. It was great having you today, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Well done. Thanks, Taylor. See you Thanks. soon.